Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Ineash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. And, and no looking, looking to my left and right, I realize I'm alone. But that's because I'm recording remotely. And no Jace this week. Or this yeah. fortnight. The crazy progress of technology has brought us to the point where we can have conversations through such long distances. Can't even see each other. Indeed. Uh, Jason will be back next episode, I'm sure, with... Uh, with vengeance, with a yeah. vengeance. Vengeance sounds like Kibbe mad, but a vengeance <laughs> sounds just like they've been biting their energy, right? I mean, could be both. I don't know what you did to piss Jace off, man, but... <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get our asses whooped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. It feels kind of weird, just the two of us. I think it's been a long time since there's only been two people on an episode. And it's Although, been a long time since we've recorded uh, separately that wasn't worth the candle. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Although we will have a third person for the bulk of the show, which actually I kind of am weird. I'm not. I'm not sure the, the word is regretting. I, I'm regretting that I didn't make a decision or a. a okay, so uh, normally we don't have guests for this part where we talk about the sequences unless they're you know already in the rationalist community. Uh, but as I was rereading some of the roots of progress links uh, that I because I got into the blog uh, last year during the whole pandemic lockdown thing and i re- reread a few of them for the podcast today spoiler alert we're talking to jason from roots of progress um i noticed that at the bottom of a lot of them said here's comments on the subreddit and here's comments on less wrong like links to those and i was like huh maybe like i mean i, I know it's well known with the less wrong uh sphere maybe he's like enough into this that i should have asked him if he wanted to join for uh for this discussion but it's too late now yeah, and you know if he's busy, that'd rather get him just for his specialty anyway. But that's uh, true. Yeah, it was clear for me reading a handful of his posts that if he's not into the less wrong stuff, he jams with it really well anyway. So yeah, and yeah, I guess he's like CEO of a nonprofit now, so he maybe doesn't have time to jam about old sequences from fifteen years ago. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of old sequences, shall we get into the reading of this week's sequences? We are not CEOs, and we do have the time. So exactly. <laughs> Uh, so the first one that we have time for today is terminal values and instrumental values, in which uh, Eliezer says that on a purely instinctive level, many human planners behave as if they can dis- as if they distinguish between means and ends. For example, he says, if you want chocolate and you know there's chocolate at the supermarket, you go down to the supermarket uh, because going to the supermarket is a means to get that end. And if suddenly you were to hear that they had no super uh, no chocolate there, then you wouldn't go to the supermarket because. You weren't going to the supermarket because you like the supermarket and you like going there. You were going there for the chocolate specifically. I'll say at the at the meta level on this post, either I am failing to grab, like I'm, I, I either already understand this so well mm-hmm. that I felt this post was needlessly verbose, or I understand it way less than I think I do, and I'm missing a lot of the understanding here. But to me, the the difference between a terminal and instrumental value makes sense. Like when talking about humans, I get when you're talking about building robots, it's different. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I didn't see why this was so, so, um, why he, why he felt the need to be so. What am I trying to say? Verbose with all this? Yeah, but I well, it was fun. I, I, I think I do sort of know why because um, I believe Eliezer has the same thoughts as I do about wireheading and um. Like his line is, I've noticed people get confused between means and ends, more formally instrumental values and terminal values. And I think that's where wireheading disagreements come from, that a lot of people are like, I want to be happy. That is my terminal value. And so I would be happy to just stick a wire in my head that permanently um, stimulates the happiness center of my brain uh, for the rest of my life, which, you know, is as long as medicine can keep me alive, possibly eternity if tech has gotten that high. And uh, yeah, that's great. I want that for me. I want that for everyone. That's all the human race is about. Yay, maximum happiness through a wire stimulation. And I want to hear the steel man of that at some point, because that sounds like the steel man, but it's it's so paper thin. Wes is a a wire header, so we can get him on here to talk about why he's so wrong. (laughs) Or or have uh, have him educate me, because I don't know. To me, I I like stuff. I like uh, challenges. And if that's but you part of only like, actual... like those because they make you happy, right? They make me happy in a way that, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll save the wireheading if we run out of time talking about the post. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think, like, for me, I think that is one of these confusions that I don't think happiness is a terminal value. Uh, I think it is something that helps us, uh, motivates us towards our terminal values. I don't know. The, the, 
the value of my uh, child being happy and safe is what I want. And uh, not just me being happy because I believe that, you know? Right. That seems to be the, actually that ties really well into this. Like we, you know, if, if you had a child that you cared about and you wanted to, you know, be successful and whatever flourish, then you could take a drug that made you think they were happy while they slowly starved to death, or mm -hmm. you could, you know, actually enjoy them being happy, which it mm -hmm. seems like you would, even if like you, you were a little less than maximally happy by doing it the hard way. I, I feel like most people still choose to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree, but, uh, I, the wire headers do not. And, uh, <laughs> maybe I am misunderstanding and straw manning, but we will get one on to defend his or her ridiculous position at some point in the future. Sounds uh, fair. Yeah, yeah. Eliezer says English doesn't embody a sharp distinction between means and ends. I want to save my sister's life, and I want to administer penicillin to my sister. Use the same word, want. Uh, which is, you know, I don't know, possibly where uh, this confusion begins to uh, start with. I feel like this isn't the best distinction, like the best example he could have gave. I think it gives some better ones later on. Um, I think this is a decent one because the only reason you want to give your sister penicillin is that she won't die, right? Yeah, but this one, I guess, just seems so intuitive. I'd rather choose one where like people might actually get confused. Okay. Well, in that case, we can. Well, we could skip past that. But he also brings out the the follow up example: if saving my sister's life would cause the Earth to be swallowed up by a black hole, then I wouldn't administer penicillin. Does this mean that saving my sister's life was not a terminal or intrinsic value? Because you know, before it was very clear: giving her penicillin is just instrumental. Her being alive is the terminal. But if he wouldn't save her life, if the Earth would be hit by a black hole, then uh, was it really terminal? Right. This is where, like, I think that it. This is the kind of thinking that comes into play if you're going to build a god out of out of code, right? Uh, sure. But if if you're a human, you're typically not choosing between black holes swallowing the planet and some other outcome. So, like, and I get it. Like, that's like the extreme example. You know, I might not um, blow up a hospital so I could steal all their penicillin just to give it to my sister, right? Like or that's something that I would. as a human might actually be able to do rather than like yeah. have the earth swallow the, or be swallowed by a black hole. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Terminal values are desirable without conditioning on other consequences. Uh, see that that's, I, I kind of draw contention with that. I, um, I think that's the, yeah, that's the big mistake that the wire hitting and a lot of other people make. Like, I think that a lot of values are interlinked in a big web that rely on each other and you can't just, isolate one and say this is the terminal value yeah i think that like we can speak colloquially of terminal values mm -hmm. um but yes in in a moment where okay let's actually reflect on all the possible outcomes of this and then if you want to constrain yourself to like reality let's reflect on like the realistically probable outcomes of this you can yeah. constrain what you mean by terminal value um mm -hmm. like so I think, did I read the whole thing? Terminal values are desirable without conditioning on other consequences. Quote, I want to save my sister's life, unquote, has nothing to do with your anticipating whether she'll get injected with penicillin after that. Um, yeah. It's like, I don't know, may maybe this is just the thing, because he says that we're not good at thinking about it and we get him confused. But to me, that seems like a, a super straightforward point. Um, well, I, I think what you said about, <laughs> you know, considering the various outcomes and uh, and which ones are remotely likely, uh brings him right up into his next point. So maybe he set this up well about uh, Bayesian decision systems, which kind of brings us back to our last episode's discussion about uh, decision theories. So I kind of kind of wish that we had read this in that too, but yeah, you know, it all ties together. Anyways, he says that ideal Bayesian decision system can be set up using only four elements. First element is outcomes, a list of possible outcomes. Second element, actions, list of possible actions. Third element, utility function, uh, it is a a way to mm, evaluate each outcome and determine a uh, what the utility of each one is, how much you hate them or love them. Uh, so go through all the outcomes and assign them a numeric value about how great or awful they are. And then finally, the fourth element is conditional probability function uh, that maps onto each action and multiple basically multiplies the probability of your action resulting in that outcome and how desirable that outcome is. So, uh, you know, if if you're only 1% likely to get the penicillin you need by blowing up the hospital, it makes it 1% as valuable to do that than it would have been uh, if it was a 100% guaranteed thing. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. 
Yeah, I mean, it does. I just, uh, yeah, we'll keep going. I'll, I I don't know why I'm being all, it's not even like negative on this one because I, I, I love the point. I just, I don't know. I'm something, it's it's going against the grain on my brain and uh, we'll just, we'll push through. <laughs> Is it because, I don't know, maybe it's because like no one actually does that sort of full calculation except in extreme rare cases. They generally go by intuition and and just a gut feeling of what they believe the chances and outcomes are instead of calculating them. Does that maybe why? Part of it. I think another part is like I've been I've been mulling over the conversation we had with Matt last week, mm-hmm. which we usually record every two weeks, but since we had a guest on, we've got them scheduled for a week early. But um, you know, I, I think it would be really, really helpful to like whenever you talk about um probability theory or decision theory or uh these these kinds of uh, decision outcome considerations that you just draw a big line that says decision theory for humans and decision theory for robots. Okay. And I know a robots is, you know, a subset of AI or whatever, but I like saying robots. Yeah. Um, cause, cause breaking it up like this makes a lot of sense, but you know, it's like, is my being alive or terminal value? Is that why I ate breakfast this morning? Like that's, I don't know if it's useful for me to think of my life, you know, as a squishy meat human that way, right? I mean, maybe your terminal value is to have as many grandkids as possible, and you don't know it, but eating is just one way to get to there. I'd be having more unprotected sex if that was one of my terminal values. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> wow, it's the terminal value of your genes, at least. Right. All right, so basically, yeah, so you take those four things. You've got like a list of actions, a list of um, outcomes. You've got your utility function, which maps an outcome to a utility, which I guess we can just say like a preference um, and your conditional probability function, which maps actions to outcomes and then gives them each a probability. Um, So you take that, calculate the conditional probability of all the consequences that might follow, then add up the utilities of those consequences times their conditional probability, and then pick the best action. See, that's just Uh, not how humans do stuff. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not. I mean, maybe intuitively it's what they're trying to do. Maybe. Eh, probably not even. Most of the time, I think humans are probably just executing scripts that have been installed in them by society or family. And like, you've got to, I, I guess one of my, you know, hidden variables in my conditional probability function is like, what's the easiest thing to do? Like I made a simple, modestly healthy breakfast rather than a uh, more complex healthy breakfast this morning because yeah. it was it took 30 seconds rather than 10 minutes. Yeah. So, you know, that sort of stuff. But um, it's yeah. interesting seeing seeing how much we run on scripts that are installed. It seems, you know, kind of important to make sure the best scripts are the ones that we get installed with. But that is a different topic that we covered in many different episodes, such as the one about um, uh, Secret to Our Success. Yeah, we want to try and, you know, overcome those biases, one might say. Hell yeah, we do. Uh, so yeah, Eliezer says that if all that's important is one's mental state, then you would indeed be rather unlikely to sacrifice your own life to save another because uh, a, a, then you don't have a mental state once you've sacrificed your life. <laughs> so you, that sacrificing your own life would always be at the very bottom of everything, which is, you know, possibly evidence that most people want something other than I wish to have the mental state of being happy. But again, I'm just, I'm getting sidetracked to beat flog my own horse right there. They're just virtue signaling. You know, if you run into a building to save orphans that you've never met, you're just doing it just to tell everyone how awesome you are. Right. So that way they'll want to have sex with you and you'll have more grandchildren. <laughs> and the fact that you die doing it is just, uh, you know, because your brain's not good at math. So stupid brain. I said that tongue in cheek for if I if my smirk didn't come through on the audio. <laughs> it, it, it sometimes can be hard to tell if someone's smirking over audio. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, All right. So yeah, I think where he he says this is where the uh, part one of the ways that breakdown can happen between instrumental and uh, terminal values is that if a causal network is sufficiently regular, you and you can find a state B that always leads to state C regardless of how you achieved state B. Then if state C was like your terminal value, the one you wanted to achieve, you could just plan efficiently on working out a way to get to B all the time because getting to B would get you to C. So he says, suppose for, but he says, suppose, for example, that there's some particular value of B that doesn't lead to C, which is, I think, the punchline of basically every evil genie story ever, <laughs> <laughs> that you wish for a thing and the genie is like, here's that thing. And you're like, no, that's the opposite of what I wanted. I didn't realize that what I really wanted was the other thing. And you fucked me. Uh, I like that. 
probability pump or what is that one that's probably coming up because it's super uh, related I, to this. I think that's, yeah, the, I think that's what it was, the probability pump. Yeah, the outcome pump or something. Outcome that, pump, thank you. That's that, it. that lands perfectly with this, uh, yeah. where you said the, the, you know, evil genie. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so he says this is an example that instrumental values are generally a leaky abstraction. Uh, you sometimes have to toss away the cached value, like the, the thought that B is always what you want to get, and compute out the actual expected utilities to realize that getting B in this particular case would be the opposite of what you want because it will lead to negative C. Uh, part of being efficient without being suicidal is noticing when convenient shortcuts break down. Um, and yeah, he says that he fears that the human brain does not strongly type the distinction between terminal and moral beliefs and instrumental moral beliefs. Sorry, between terminal moral beliefs and instrumental moral beliefs uh, and gives the example of gun control because the two people arguing about we should ban guns because it leads to less crime or we should um, ban guns because uh, we should uh, make guns freely available to everyone because it leads to less crime are both uh, wanting less crime, but they just have different factual uh disagreements on how to get there but that somehow gets lost in if you don't really sit down and break it down with the other person so he says we should ban guns and we should save lives don't feel different as moral beliefs even though technically they are because uh one can argue whether or not banning guns saves lives or costs lives well the thing is that that's what i like about that particular debate and you know usually bringing in the political examples pro or like politically charged example isn't a good move but this is a really good one mm -hmm. because nobody's arguing that we should have more guns because it's great that more people get shot right yeah so like when you say well look we should ban guns and we should we should save lives those are those are the same va those those map to a similar value right like yeah. less dead people the better I, yeah, and I mean, I, I think this is a really good example because I was, my family, you know, come from Europe. They have a lot of the strong European, some of the European values installed. And one of them is that uh, guns are bad and no one needs guns and you should never have guns. It's really sometimes interesting if you read or watch fiction like from the UK and a gun gets brought up, just like everyone in the room is like, what the fuck? You have a gun? What's wrong with you? It's like, <laughs> like if someone just casually was tossing around a thermonuclear detonator or something, you know, like everyone kind of freaks out. Whereas here in America, we're just like, oh, yeah, hey, there, there's a gun here. That's some people own guns. Anyways, um, it's so, really yeah, funny, I, I, like in in non-American cinema or TV shows and stuff, the bad guy has guns, right? Mm, Unless like it's mm -hmm. James Bond, maybe, but uh, especially if it's like Japanese or Korean fiction rarely do like yeah. the good guys have guns and if they do they're doing something ethically dubious yeah. and james bond is american fiction anyway i mean like i totally Ian valid fleming, point yeah, yeah Ian fleming maybe but yeah yeah, yeah the it was adopted by hollywood and it's, it's been american since the first james yeah, bond I, i'm silly they're not british movies <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um but yeah but to me very much saying we should ban guns and we should save lives feels like the exact same thing because guns kill people that's that's what they were made for and it just it seems very intuitive to me uh, even though like i know that's not true and i now have a firearm just in case you know locked away but it's still a uh it still feels like the same statement to me so oh, this I, I, I didn't well know you pulled the trigger on that decision yes yes I, I now have something just in case you know someday maybe ever i need it and if i don't great that's the world i want to live in also if I that was a do, great joke steven good pun what what was the joke pulled the trigger on that decision oh my god okay. yay <laughs> did you if do you that on purpose of course ah. if you don't roll your eyes at least once every time we get on it's because we're sitting down in the context of where i usually record everything not everything is a clue yeah i feel the need to torture you with puns oh, um, man. but it's funny because you can you can have somebody on the opposite side of that argument saying we should um you know, uh, I don't. I don't think there's anyone sane saying like we should have no gun control restrictions or something. But someone could say uh, we should we should have easier access for you know sound of mind citizens to access guns. Uh, I have heard someone and, argue that all able-bodied uh, people should be trained in gun use and be required to keep a gun at home like they do in Switzerland. That's an interesting approach. I I kind of want to give people the choice to do whatever they want at home, but. Um, but someone could say, no, we should have easier access to guns and we should save lives, right? And that's the that's the same value as we should ban guns and we should save lives. Yeah. I think anyway. uh, the quote I've heard used is a armed society is a polite society, if I'm remembering Claire correctly. Yeah, that's that's the quote. I mean, I 
haven't spent time in Switzerland, maybe they're all super polite because they're all afraid that everyone will shoot each other. But that seems like, <laughs> you know, I'm sure everyone's really polite to Lord Voldemort. But like, is that really kind of like the kind of neighbors you want? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Now that and said, it, there's all kinds of good reasons to have guns. I'm just saying that like, because it makes people nice to each other, uh, I would need that fleshed out a little bit before I'd sign on with it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. He basically wraps up by saying, extracting out the terminal values we have uh, to inspect this mismatch of valuable things, uh, trying to figure out which ones are getting their value from somewhere else is a difficult project. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it's, uh, values are complicated. Yeah. We can't print out our complete network of values derived from other values. We probably don't even store the whole history of how the values got there. Uh, by considering, he does point out that by considering the right moral dilemmas, would you do X if Y, we can uh, sometimes figure out where our values come from, but does caution that even those can get, you know, go wonky. But yeah, this is where we get things like the trolley experiment. Yeah. And, and, you know, would you do X if Y, would you push the person in front of the trolley? Most people say no, that just might mean that their, their values are inconsistent, right? Or that they value not like being physically involved in a murder, they value that over saving five lives, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you put the planet in front of the trolley and you stay up to push one person, most people I think would push them, right? Yeah. But if I, it's just, you know, saving two for one or five for one, they might be like, I don't know, having literal blood on my hands feels different than flipping a switch. See, but I there's, think no, there's no morally important distinction there is probably what people, you know, that that's the, the result of that intuition pump, right? I think you're right that most people don't actually make any of these calculations. They're just running scripts and the script handed by society is don't push a person in front of a train and maybe enough, you know, enough bodies on the other end could overwhelm that. But I think for the vast majority of people, they're just like running the script. Don't push people in front of trains and they answer no. And it takes, you know, weirdos like us to think about, well, but you know, we would have flipped the switch. So why don't we push the person? It's the same kind of thing. And, uh, and yeah, you're right that that is probably weird of us. Well, to be to be fair, this is a weirdness that comes out of like moral philosophy and that rationalists are just on board with. Um, it's true. Philosophers they, are notable weirdos. Well, and, and they were, you know, I think the trolley problem isn't, a, you know, it, it's a, there's a lot of um, gripes with, I don't know, the, the discipline of philosophy that less wrong has. But mm -hmm. I think some exploration of moral philosophy, like trolley problems and whatever utilitarian uh, trade-offs, those are valuable, um, results of that industry. Right. Yeah. But yeah. you know, it's, I don't know if it's just society. It's also partly genetic, you know, we're social creatures and acting in that way is, um, is different acting in such a way where you're like physically involved in the outcome is just different to our brains, not just like from our software, but also from like, well, I guess I'd say maybe the firmware, um, <laughs> the firmware level of it, like what comes from our genes. Um, I think that you can observe a lot of this behavior in children too, you know, like doing the mean thing or, or monkeys, you know, we don't set them up with trolley problems, but you can do similar things. Um, it's, it's more innate than just like, well, my parents and my school and when I'm growing up told me not to push people in front of trains. Um, it's, there's, there's something salient about being involved there personally. You know, like another good example for moral philosophy is Peter Singer's, uh, kid in a pond right yeah um if you're walking past a shallow pond and there's a two-year-old drowning in it there's no one else around well you run in and save them unless you're an asshole you don't be like well i'll be late to my whatever work meeting or i'll ruin my shoes if you if those are your reasons that you don't go save the kid you're a monster but i don't know i don't know how innate that is though like i think the capability to be that person is innate to everyone but like there's plenty of societies and cultures, especially historically, that were all sorts of violent and awful, and people didn't seem to have any sorts of problems at all if they got installed with the, you know, oppressing this type of person is a great thing to do software that they would just go right along with it and never feel the least bit bad. I think that's part of the genius of using a, a child for this example, though, because I, I, like, I don't yeah, sure, it's if, it's, if it's a child from the other tribe or something, then whatever stupid older humans might have let the kid drown, but... It's not like saying, hey, look, a person, you know, from the other political party, you know, tripped and fell and is drowning mm -hmm. in the ponds. Do you let them die? Right. Mm -hmm. But if you say an innocent baby, then mm -hmm. your your evolutionary programming kicks in and says, I can't let a human baby die when it costs me so little to save it. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, 
first off, like that's just bad for like my species genetic fitness, but also I would look like an asshole if anyone ever found out. Right. So right. Th- since we're social creatures too, that comes into play. Yeah. But really like at the end of the day, I don't really care where those values come from. Cause I like that one. So yeah. I'm just happy to run in and save the kid. Right. Right. Yeah. But the, I brought that up because the, that seems morally salient, but metaphor, uh, semi literally pulling a kid from a pond who's 5,000 miles away doesn't give you any like psychological kickback for it. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like giving to charity is so unappealing because mm-hmm. you don't get to feel like a superhero when you drag this kid out of a pond. Yeah. Instead, you're just paying somebody else to do it. And that doesn't feel as cool. Interesting. I wonder if somebody set up a charity where you paid $2,000 for the opportunity to run into a pond and save a kid. And it only costs like $50 to set up this drowning kid scenario. So the, the, the rest of the money would go to saving, you know, kids in Africa from malaria or whatever, like how popular that would be. It would be hard to do, though, because you'd have to have an actual child in risk of drowning if you don't run in to save them. And that uh, that's that's ethically dubious. That's what I was going to say. say it, is the parents who would sign off on that experiment would uh, I, I don't think they should be allowed to have that kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think this one wraps up nicely. We don't know what our own values are or where they come from. Being ignorant of our own values may not always be fun, but at least it's not boring. Which it's true. We demonstrated by talking for the last ten minutes. <laughs> we we spend quite a bit of time doing this sort of thing. All um, right, shall we move on to evolving to extinction? Yeah, which is the kind of thing that you would do if uh, you just let kids drown in ponds. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose so, unless they were kids with competing genes. I don't know. Um, how to put that? What if they're alien kids? Yeah, then you look right. around. Yeah, if if uh, you know Neanderthals hadn't gone extinct, right? Then we'd mm-hmm. we'd be like all super inclined to let them drown in ponds or something. Well, apparently we could re- reproduce with the Neanderthals, so I'm not sure that is uh, quite as as apt a comparison. Maybe, maybe a slightly more distant cousin then. Yeah, like maybe if you see a chimpanzee drowning, you're not going to run into the lake to save it. The only reason I wouldn't is that I'd be afraid that it would hurt me. Because they're See? really strong and it'd be and it'd yeah. be terrified, but like if it was unconscious and I oh whatever if I knew I wouldn't get killed or hurt doing it, I'd do it in a hot second. Yeah, you know, I'd run in and save a, a puppy. I mean, I've you know who's who's been hanging out in a pool and like there's like a bee and you like pick it up and set it on the side of the pool so it doesn't drown in the pool. Yeah, you know, but I guess that's that well, doesn't that, cost that doesn't you know, cost you yeah you know, thousands yeah. of dollars. All right, so we got de- de- derailed before we even started. Evolving to extinction. It is a very <laughs> this is, common. Miscon- this is the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is a very common misconception that an evolution works for the good of its species, which was a hell of a way to open up. Um, yeah, I, I did always think that. What I like about this is that I like Eliezer's tendency to talk about um, evolutions as like, well, evolutions as plural things, right? Mm-hmm an evolution and what's funny is even like google marks that as syntact syntactically suspect aha and like so we're looking at our our shared google doc here Um, yeah and but i think it is the correct way to think about it yeah i agree yeah it's awesome he says there's a natural tendency to think that if an evolution fairy is operating on the species she must be optimizing for the species but what really changes are the gene frequencies and frequencies don't increase or decrease according to how much the gene helps the species as a whole which it took a little while to get my head wrapped around that, but that's what the rest of this post is for. Uh, he gives the question, why are boys and girls born in roughly equal numbers? Balanced gender ratios are found even in species where the male impregnates the female and vanishes into the mist. Hmm. Uh, and this was, this was back before, uh, back when gender and sex had been conflated into the same word. And so, you know, don't, don't at me, as they say nowadays. Yeah, this was, you know, God... 2007 which is a lot longer ago than you probably think it was yeah <laughs> yeah um uh-huh. yeah so that is a good question let's let's keep exploring it he says has us consider two groups on different sides of mountain in group a mother gives birth to two males and two females in group b each mother gives birth to three females and one male uh since a male is not Restricted by how many uh, females you can impregnate, uh, Group A and Group B will have the same number of children, but Group B will have fifty percent more grandchildren and a hundred twenty-five percent more great-grandchildren because they will have more uh, wombs avail- available for uh, for gestating humans. I guess as the least I don't know I, 
a way to put it that is technically correct, even though it it, it feels uh, icky to put it that way. But there it is. If we're talking about species other than humans, we could get through this without stumbling. But yeah, it is weird to talk about it in those terms yeah. with humans. But them's that's them's the rules. So you know what? Maybe we should have just just started from the very beginning. As you know, these are two species of gerbils, groups of gerbils on either side of the mountain, <laughs> and that's why they can't talk to each other because they're gerbils, and the mountain's really big from a gerbil point of view. We can switch to gerbils. I think they're really funny. Yeah. He says, right. you might think this would be a significantly evo- a significant evolutionary advantage for the big female gerbils tribe. But consider, the rarer males become, the more reproductively valuable they become. Not to the group, but to the individual parent. The fewer males, the greater the individual genetic contribution per male. If all females, ar- If all the females around you are doing what's good for the group, what's good for the species... And birthing one male per ten females, you can make a genetic killing by birthing all males, all of whom will have, on average, ten times as many grandchildren as their female cousins. Uh, so that is a good point. You could win by <laughs> cheating. <laughs> Evolution notices cheaters pretty fast. It sometimes does, yeah. Uh, he, he <laughs> So we step away from this for a little bit, but we will loop back around to it by the end. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, He says that when you consider that nearly all of your ancestors are dead, it's clear that survival of the fittest is a tremendous misnomer. It's replication of the fitter would be more accurate, although technically fitness is defined only in terms of replication anyway. So anyways, yeah, I I, I really think from now on, whenever someone says survival of the fittest, I should point out that almost everything ever is dead and has not survived. So replication of the fittest is much closer. Yeah, or at least of the fitter, at least, you know, because fittest, I, I don't know, I've always, survival of the fittest is like a good, whatever, bumper sticker explanation, mm-hmm. but it's so bad the second you drill into it. Yeah. And it's like, what, the dinosaurs weren't fit? Well, you know, they were until a meteorite hit the planet, right? Right, and suddenly and, they weren't very fit for the new environment. Yeah, but it, 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 because that challenges the intuitions of like fittest, you're telling me that these little squishy, whatever, shrew like mammals were more fit than t-rexes well yeah only after the uh space apocalypse then sure but uh (laughs) anyway replication of the fitter um we can we can move on yes yes uh his big point in all this is that natural selection is really about gene frequencies the struggle in natural selection is not the competition of organisms for resources that's an ephemeral thing when all the participants will vanish in a generation The real struggle is the competition of alleles for frequency in the gene pool. This is the lasting consequence that creates lasting information. And uh, that brings him to this whole evolving to extinction thing. It's perfectly possible for an allele to spread by fixating, uh, to spread to fixation by outcompeting an alternative allele, which was, quote unquote, better for the species. If the flying spaghetti monster magically created a species whose gender mix was perfectly optimized to ensure the survival of the species, say maybe one male to ten females or whatever the perfect ratio is for their environment, uh, the op- then the evolution ah, then the evolution would rapidly degrade this species optimum back into the individual selection optimum of equal parental investment in males and females, uh, because that's just how evolution works. He says, imagine, for example, a Frodo gene. That sacrifices its vehicle to be- save its entire species from an extinction event. What happens to the Frodogene frequency as a result? It goes down. Okay, thanks. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> if species level extinction events occur regularly, call this a Buffy environment, uh, which is a, a reference to the old Buffy Vampire the Slayer TV series, which was great and which had an extinction level event at the end of every season. Uh, except for the first one, I think it was the second one or third season where they really started ramping them up. Anyways, if a species level extinction threat occurs regularly, then the Frodo gene will systematically decrease in frequency and vanish. And soon thereafter, so will the species. They will have evolved to extinction. Hmm. I, well, what explain that for me for a second. Cause intu- intuitively it sounds like the more extinction level threats that we're facing, the more valuable Frodo genes would be. But Frodo genes remove themselves from the gene pool and cannot replicate. Oh, right, right. Uh, this is assuming that Frodo dies saving the planet or saving the yes. species. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, the Unlike fact that, the he, got, that he got to hack his way out of that in the books just kind of took some of the punch out of it. Yeah. Maybe we could have called it a Ripley from Aliens 3 gene, but that was the worst aliens. So um, let's just not even. We'll to, yeah, we, we can't use that example. 
Yeah. Also, spoiler alert for the worst aliens movie. <laughs> I think if the movie's thirty five years old, it's past the statute of limitations. And terrible. No one should watch it. <laughs> we should just spoiler it for everyone so they don't have to. All right. So he's talking. Then he moves on to talk about viruses. Uh, there's a tension between individual viruses replicating as fast as possible versus the benefit of leaving the host of leaving the host alive long enough to transmit the illness. Um, this is a good real world example of group selection. And yeah. I like this a lot because we're, you know, now the average person on the planet knows more about viruses than they did three years ago. Mm-hmm. And we can all, we can all attest to at least some intuitive understanding of this. You know, if COVID had a 100% lethality rate and you died in five minutes of contracting it, it would have died out real, real fast. Right. right? Yeah. If it, if it has a uh, 1% fatality rate and it takes three weeks to die from it, you've got plenty of time to cough on as many people as you can. Right. Exactly. This was uh, also the historically the case for cholera, I believe, that in pre-industrial settings, uh, cholera was uh, much more benign uh, because it needed time to spread. Uh, or if it killed off its host too fast, then it wouldn't spread. But uh, once we had really dense cities like uh, London and Paris without great sewage, it would spread like crazy. And so the extremely virulent uh, version that reproduced like crazy and killed its host real fast uh became the the more fit one because there were plenty of humans all over the place anyway and it didn't matter if it killed its host within a matter of days <sighs> viruses i know anyways but he also brings us back to the uh the male sex selection thing uh we were talking about earlier because this is based on a real thing that actually happens there's a segregation disorder on the male sex chromosome of some mice which causes only male children to be born all those male children children are also carrying the segregation disorder. Then these males and pregnant females who give birth to only male children and so on. The product, reproductive fitness of this allele is extremely high since it produces twice as many copies of itself in the succeeding generation as its non-mutant alternatives. That's what but we're doing the, to uh, mosquitoes right now, right? I believe that is uh, one of the things. Yes, the, the yeah, gene drive. I think we just I don't know if like it's actually implemented last year. Well, did thought, they actually? I thought I heard it on the Mind Killer, so you'd know more about it than I would. Well, it's been proposed. I don't think anyone's actually uh, moved forward with uh, moving forward because I don't know. There's get your ass out there and start killing mosquitoes. Yeah, right. I don't think mosquitoes are in the sphere of things to consider, like morally. And at least as of my cursory glance into it, like 15 years ago, they don't do anything for the ecology that they live in. Bioethicists need jobs too, man. And the only way they can do that. <laughs> Just you know, mosquitoes if, around. if a few million people die of malaria every year, it's worth it to give those bioethicists jobs. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the kind of intuition pump we get from moral philosophy. All right. <laughs> uh, he has a few other examples. About 50% of the total genome of maize consists of transposons, DNA elements whose primary function is to copy themselves into other locations of DNA. They don't do anything except copy themselves into DNA. Uh, this class seems to have first appeared in... Drosophilia, I guess that's the the maze, only in the middle of the 20th century and spread to every population of the species within 50 years. It says the ALU sequence in humans is a 300-based transposon. It's repeated between 300,000 and a million times in the human genome. These, these cheating motherfuckers are doing pretty well. Cancerous cells do pretty well in the body, prospering and amassing more resources, far outcompeting more obedient counterparts for a while. Uh, multicellular organisms can only exist because they've evolved powerful internal mechanisms to outlaw evolution. If the cells start <laughs> evolving, they rapidly evolve to extinction. The organism dies. I like the the quick pause on the ALU sequence in humans. The 300 base trans, transposon that's repeated between 300,000 and a million times. Yeah. So mutations in genetic replication happen at some regular low rate, right? Mm-hmm. If you could remove the 300 million approximately, you know, pointless genes in just or, or pointless uh, uh, sequences in just the ALU sequence, right? Mm-hmm. Or I guess base pairs is what I was trying to say. Um, then wait, base pairs? Is that right? Why am I blanking on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, if you could remove those 300 million from the genome, the human would be no worse off for it. But the... Uh, the replication of each strand of DNA would be more reliable going forward. Yes. It sounds like the kind of thing we could just do with CRISPR. Knock this shit do, out. Do we need those bioethicists to have their jobs? <laughs> well, they, they could argue about the fallout of it and how far we should go with this, but let's start here and see what happens. 
I, I think that would be a good idea to at least give it a shot. And uh, sometimes fitness is not always your friend, is what he ends with. I don't know if in any of these evolution sequences he or posts he mentions the selfish gene. Mm-hmm. Um, if he doesn't, he alludes to it a few times, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this this whole post is about the gene centric view of natural selection, yeah. And that's the that's the point of the book. It's not about how people should be selfish or whatever. It's a lens through which to view evolution. That's more that explains a lot more than just like looking at organisms. I, therefore, is less wrong is a less wrong way to think about it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's that's the name of the show. <laughs> uh, but when you consider evolution from the perspective of individual gerbils trying to whatever weigh their various um, fitness strategies versus the genes that are riding around in those gerbils. Um, You know, it's, it's easier to think of the gerbils being the driving force because they're the ones doing things like actively. Mm -hmm. But, but when you just kind of change gears and look at the uh, what, what it is they're piloting around, right? What it is that is being replicated. Um, Mm -hmm. The gerbils aren't being replicated. Their genes are. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely, um, I I just like the, it's like just a a zoom in on the, the field that I think helps to illuminate a lot. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Like I said, fitness is not always your friend. (laughs) It's, it's, it's a post that stuck with me and it changed a bit about how I think about evolution. Yeah. Well, that's also. uh, Later on, we, uh, I don't know if it's in the sequences or if it was just later in my life that I learned about this, but the island dwarfism thing where species on islands tend to get smaller and that includes humans and, uh, some of the like ancient, um, quasi human, human cousin, uh, species that we found appeared to have lost the, uh, the big prefrontal cortex that we had because they didn't need it anymore on the island they were on and kind of evolved back into, not being uh, fully sapient the way we are, which was really creepy. Well, they evolved forward to that way, right? Well, yes, yes, uh, you're right. Yeah, we would consider I mean, that a backward step. Exactly, but it's just fun to think about. Like I said, from the from the gene centric view of that, like to me, my favorite example is if you're out in a field and see like a really big tree, mm-hmm. and you're wondering like why the hell is this so big? Mm-hmm. It's burning a lot of energy to grow that tall. Yeah, and it's not doing it to get closer to the sun, right? <laughs> it's it's doing it to stand taller than other trees, so that mm-hmm. it can so that it can outcompete them for sunshine. But mm-hmm. the trees don't know that they're alone out there, right? Yeah. Uh, so they're they're going to just keep growing big and tall and ridiculously proportioned for what their purpose is. If right. they were trying to absorb as much sun as possible, they'd look like shrubs that are just really wide, right? Hmm. Um. It's it's fun. I don't know. Um. I would recommend. I haven't read The Selfish Gene in its entirety because it's really, really big, but he summarizes it in uh, um, The Greatest Show on Earth, Richard Dawkins does. And that's a that's a fun book. And I think that's where the example of the trees comes from. Excellent. Okay, well, read that as well. And uh, for also read for next time, our next sequences, which we're actually reading three next time because uh, I, I don't remember my thinking. It's been like a week since I did this but uh it was something along the lines of they went really well together or one was really short or something so anyways the next time we meet on this show we will be discussing the sequence posts no evolutions for corporations or nano devices (laughs) the simple math of everything and conjuring an evolution to serve you which i would say would be great for our halloween episode but i think it's actually slightly after halloween yeah it's gonna be after halloween uh we are recording this before halloween so just in case anyone's wondering why we're so spooky this episode. Yeah. But, Stephen, you and me are going to take a break. And when we come back, we will have on the show with us... Jason w- Crawford, founder and CEO of Roots of Progress. And we are back. This time we are joined by Jason Crawford of Roots of Progress. Hello, Jason. Uh, hello. Uh, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've... I think I was first made aware of your blog about a year and a half ago or so. I started reading it near the beginning of COVID. Um, and just, okay, so I originally found it as a history of tech blog, which was fascinating. But how would you uh, characterize Roots of Progress? Uh, yeah, uh, the history of technology is a large part of what the blog is about. And uh, uh, I sometimes you know, extend that by saying it's also about the philosophy of progress. And ultimately, I want to sort of see what the, what the history, what light the history can shed on that philosophy. 
Excellent. And we are about to jump into some of that. But before we started any of that, uh, at the time when I was exposed to it, I did not know this, but it seems from some of the things that I've uh, seen, read, and also the things you've said that you're actually uh, in the or at least adjacent to the rationalist community as well. Um, yeah, definitely. I would say I've kind of uh, slowly sidled up to the rationalist community. Um, uh, I probably first discovered it through um, Slate Star Codex back around uh, 2015 or so. Uh, and then I kind of, you know, I got into uh, the, the first Slate Star uh, post I actually read was his analysis of the California drought, um, mm. the water shortage. And it was just such a uh, it was so well written. It was so nonpartisan and like informative and fact based uh, that I was like, "Wow, more people should be writing about political issues this way." And and so it, it you know quickly became one of my favorite blogs. Sometime within the next year uh, or two of that, I think I discovered um, Eliezer's book uh, "Inadequate Equilibria," which mm-hmm. I read and thought was really smart. And um, sometime in that general milieu, I started following Julia Galef on uh, both Twitter and Facebook. And thought she was really interesting. And so I just, you know, one by one, I was kind of discovering these thinkers. Um, I I think I got pulled more into the community, actually, uh, when I got some of the folks from Less Wrong invited me to just start cross posting the Roots of Progress onto Less Wrong. And, um, you know, that's been that's been good because it's gotten me exposure to this audience, but also vice versa. I don't have comments enabled on uh, the on Roots of Progress itself. And so a lot of the comments, you know, I, I basically just point people to other sites like Less Wrong or Reddit to go comment on things. And so I get a bunch of commentary through uh, through Less Wrong. And that's just, a, you know, a, often a very interesting conversation. Yeah. they it, One of the few places where reading the comments is not something one needs should avoid. Well, and disabling <laughs> yes. comments on your own blog is always, I think, a smart move because that way you're not kind of like... You're never compelled to engage with it, but you're sort of in charge of moderating it or whatever. And it's just like, you know, I don't feel like dealing with that. But if I put on less wrong, less wrong can moderate it. Great. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Cool. So when did you exactly start the blog? Because it had already had a lot of posts up when I found it. Yeah. So I began it as a a side project in early 2017. I think the very first post was in April 2017. Um, and at first it was just a hobby. Uh, I was, so my previous career was in the tech industry. My background's in computer science. I was a software engineer, engineering manager, and tech startup uh, co-founder for many years. And uh, it was while I was doing that, that I just, uh, at one point around the beginning of 2017, I was asking myself, hey, what books am I going to read next? It's always fun to read on a theme, uh, you know, and so I wanted to pick a theme and I decided to read about the Industrial Revolution and very quickly broadened that into the entire sort of story of human progress. Yeah. And a few months into that, it, I was so fascinated by the topic that I decided to just start writing down some publishing some notes on what I was reading and what I was thinking about it. And then in the beginning, they were very brief um just little notes about new concepts I was learning about, open questions I had, that kind of thing. Um, but after doing that for about two, two and a half years, um, I had gotten into writing some bigger and longer and more in-depth posts. Some of them uh, had gone viral and taken off. I was starting to get an audience. And long story short, I went full-time on it as an independent researcher in uh, late 2019, so just about two years ago. Um, and more recently, in fact, uh, I've gotten enough support for my work uh, that I have turned uh, the blog into a full-fledged nonprofit organization. So The Roots of Progress is now a nonprofit. Fantastic. Uh, okay, I think we want to explore all of that, but obviously not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I don't know, let's, let's touch on like the history of tech stuff, because I that that's what initially drew me in. And I found that really fascinating. I think one of my favorite posts is the one on iron from mythical to mundane. Yep. Uh, which which seem it goes back like all the way to when iron was you know a thing that fell out of the sky in meteorites and was worshipped as a, a metal from the gods, but it it starts with like the most basic um how what is iron and how did people originally smelt it in like these clay furnaces where they threw in lime and some like slag falls out and they hammer it uh, and and work it with tongs. Uh, it was. And it takes you all the way through, like how people slowly began to un- find other ways that they could do with uh, other things they could do with iron, how they could make it harder. Uh, how in I think it was India they would burn it or melt it in crucibles. It. Thank you, melt it in crucibles for like weeks at a time, and that produced the legendary Damascus steel. Uh, yes. 
which, which and, actually came from India. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, but made the it, they made didn't it. Want into you to know. swords in Damascus. Yeah, well, there's actually a lot of um, there's a lot of this stuff, especially in the ancient world, uh, uh, and through through almost close to modern times, is um, uh, people tried to keep a lot of trade secrets. And mm-hmm. one of the things one of the things trade one of the trade secrets was where did you get your materials from? And so wow. very often the true origin of anything from steel to spices would be obscured by those who were trading in it because they didn't want you to go to the source and you know get your own it was where they got it from was part of the trade secret that they uh uh that they made money on i heard one of the the ways people protected trade secrets was to also invoke mysticism and religion into things uh, that you had to do these certain rites and worship these gods to do it correctly and like involved in those would also be the things which ended up putting more carbon into the steel or whatever but People didn't necessarily know that. I think you even said that in your post that uh, they did a lot of things. I alluded to that, yes. There's a lot of things that were just based on lore. And of course, I mean, like a lot of stuff, uh, you can see this in agriculture, you can see it in medicine, and you see it in materials. People didn't really know what worked. Through trial and error, they had found some things that worked okay, but they didn't necessarily know even what part of what you are doing is necessary, Mm -hmm. what part of it is unnecessary, what part of it is even counterproductive, right? They had just... Ultimately, you need theory, you need science to cut through all of that and sort of find the productive core and and, and enhance it. Um, but you can get part of the way through trial and error, right? And so that's where people landed. Um, so yeah, I don't think embedding this stuff in mysticism was not a deliberate strategy of obfuscation to my knowledge. Um, I suppose it could have been in some times and places, but I think it's entirely plausible and, and a much simpler uh, explanation that uh, this was a pre-scientific age, and so people just didn't know what worked. They didn't have any. Um, they didn't have any basic sort of. They didn't even have really the the mechanistic view of the universe, right? The clockwork universe, mm-hmm. and so uh, it's very natural that this stuff would get bound up in um, in in more mystical notions, yeah, as again like the, was disease and agriculture and so forth. The whole world is magic. What's one more weird piece of magic? Exactly, right? Let's just find the magic that works. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of these um, discoveries seem to have been by accident. You mentioned how in Europe, the furnaces just got bigger and bigger for efficiency's sake for a while after, after the fall of Rome. And at one point, they managed to get so big and so hot that some of the iron started melting. And that was how they discovered uh, liquid iron and the ability to make cast iron things. Yeah, basically. Um, note, incidentally, that this was discovered in China much, uh, much earlier, uh, maybe as much as I think 2000 years earlier. Um, mm. Presumably, they discovered it in a similar way, right? Starting with sort of small smelting and then building larger furnaces. And then at some point, it just gets so hot that the iron melts. And then now they have to figure out something to do with this new different form of iron. Mm-hmm. I did not realize that cast iron was very brittle. Like I'd always heard stories about cannons exploding every now and then. And I had no idea why i was just like oh maybe because of all the gunpowder or something but it turns out it's just because the iron itself is brittle uh yes well that particular alloy right with a high degree of carbon right so cast Mm -hmm. iron happens once you get to more than i think about 2.1 percent uh carbon by weight um which doesn't seem like an enormous amount but it's enough to really change the character of the iron interesting so yeah you went through all this and then we kind of get into the whole industrial scientific revolution where people start actually understanding how things work and experimenting how much uh the you go into the bessemer process specifically how much do you think bessemer knew about it beforehand uh well i mean uh, he certainly would have been acquainted with general kind of what were the iron making you know techniques of his day um and my understanding is that he also knew something about the basic chemistry um so this it's a really interesting it's really interesting to look back at the 19th century um I've just been going through the similar parallel development in agriculture uh I've, the last few days I was reading going deep on the question of when was it that people figured out the the organic chemistry behind plant growth and figured out what was actually in fertilizer uh, that you know, in manure, for instance, or other things that they were using as fertilizer that actually caused the growth. And how did we make the transition from using manure and other uh, maybe natural or found substances uh, as fertilizer to being able to produce it as a chemical product? And that Ooh. also happened right around the same time, uh, right around the middle of the 19th century. 
So and chemistry was just coming into its own at this point. There were enough techniques that you could uh, that you could take a a plant or a sample of iron and and do experiments on it and figure out what it was made of, or at least what elements were contained in it and in what proportions. Um, people still didn't quite uh, know the structure. Uh, some of the, some of the larger structures, for instance, in the around this time period. Uh, people understood, for instance, that nitrogen was a co- was an element that was found in all plants and animals, and seemed to be. Uh, they, they even realized that it was crucial for animal uh, metabolism because if you if you fed animals on a diet of only sugar, uh, you know they would maybe not be hungry, but they would die. Uh, and so it was clearly something you know the the nitrogenous substances, but they hadn't yet identified protein. Or they had just they were just barely identifying it in some other part of the scientific world at that at that exact time, and so uh, you know they knew nitrogen was involved, but they didn't yet know that it was it was because it was crucial for proteins. So it's really fascinating to see these um, uh, to see these conceptions evolve, to see exactly how far you can go without a theoretical basis, right? Just kind of on the basis of trial and error and empirical observations and and observed correlations and so forth uh, to see exactly how far that takes you and exactly where it plateaus and where you need the science to go further. Do you think we were at the more or less the plateaued farthest we could get without knowing the theory behind things uh, when we got to the scientific revolution? Um <clears throat> Well, the scientific revolution as a historical period is typically taken to occur in the like, you know, 1600s thereabouts, right? Um, mm-hmm. or, or, or even before and after. So we'd barely begun to uh, <laughs> to really make industrial progress. There was, there was a lot more industrial progress we could make. But um, a, a lot of the early industrial progress was based on little science or a very moderate amount of science. Um, uh, I mean, you know, mechanization of, um, for instance, uh, textile manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. Building those machines, there may have been some basic principles of mechanics and some uh, mathematical techniques that they use to to sort of optimize the machines, but it's not as if you needed a revolution in physics or a whole new theory. Um, whereas you did need that uh, theories of chemistry to do things like synthetic fertilizer or. Um, uh, I suspect ultimately to get something like the Bessemer process. Uh, so I think that uh, what you find is that um, science, as we would think of it, very clearly enters the Industrial Revolution in something like its second phase around the mid to late 1800s. Um, it's the late 1800s where you're getting a bunch of inventions based on uh, electromagnetism, like the entire electric industry, generators and motors and light bulb. Uh, you're getting um, uh, the uh, kerosene and then gasoline, right? The sort of uh, the oil industry, and that is based on chemical techniques for refining fuels. Uh, the germ theory is coming into its own, and uh, and you're starting to get practical public health techniques based on this. So by the end of the 19th century, it's very clear that like what we would think of as very clearly as science is having direct impacts and is necessary for the big breakthroughs that are happening. In the earlier period, early 1800s, going back to 1700s, the traditional beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it is less clear. Um, I think that science had more of an uh, impact on that period than is generally seen or acknowledged. Uh, So I I I think the impact of science on that period is a little bit underrated. Um, But it's also clear that like, there was like a lot of tinkering and just sort of mechanical uh, inventions and so forth. The cotton gin, I don't think needed, uh, you know, a, a major scientific theory behind it. Um, nor did, I was just starting to read about uh, the beginnings of the, um, so what came before the telegraph? So before the electric telegraph, there was something called the optical telegraph. And literally this is just, you build st- towers on top of hills that can see each other over long distances, line of sight. And they're just literally signaling to each other with kind of flags or big wooden arms that move back and forth or, you know, whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. You really didn't need, as far as I can tell, any kind of science. It was, it was just a matter of establishing the towers and, and, uh, and, and managing the system of people to be trained in how to use them and to relay messages back and forth. But I honestly don't know why it took to the end of the 1700s for somebody to figure that one out. I hate for the first thing that I say in 10 minutes to be Gondor calls for aid, but that's what comes to mind. (laughs) Uh, That's right. I mean, there were, there were some ways of signaling, um, over long distances. There were flag, uh, systems right at, at sea right navy ships were using flags to signal uh there were 
you know, yes, you could you could start fires or you could ring bells and uh, ancient uh, generals, right? Uh, militaries had to solve this problem. How do you get everybody to charge at the same time or whatever? And so uh, they they had developed some means of sending very basic signals. What seems to have been the uh, uh, the breakthrough around this time of the optical telegraph, perhaps, is the uh, coming up with a system that would encode a, a, a general system of encoding any type of message, right? Um, so rather than like just like code. when the church bells ring, it's time to get up or it's time to go to church, uh, a very simple signal like that um, a, a, to, to create a universal uh, system that can encode any message. Like a Morse code or something. Mm-hmm. You, yep. so Even you before have a, Morse code, they had, yeah. But. You have a number of posts here that start with, why did we wait so long for, uh, which are fascinating and which ask this basic question, like we didn't need advanced science for a lot of things, and yet we didn't get a lot of these things like the cotton gin you have a whole thing about how simple and basic it is but we waited until the 1800s to get it uh and i think that brought you to the idea of the concept of progress itself is that correct yeah i mean that's one of the things that has it, it when you look at some of these inventions it, and it's really interesting so sometimes when you look into them there is a hidden uh or a non-obvious technical uh platform requirement or background um, or, or, or even some scientific breakthrough that was needed, uh, to, to, to create the invention. And so you can sort of see, aha, um, here was this prerequisite, but then there are some things where I'm still having a hard time finding what that was. Um, the telegraph, the optical telegraph that I just mentioned is one of those, the cotton gin, probably another one. Um, I, I need to dig in more to the history of the cotton gin because, um, I believe that actually Eli Whitney's famous cotton gin is not necessarily the first such ginning machine, uh, or, or, oh. uh, the, not su- the first such machine for separating, uh, cotton from seeds. I think there were some similar things. So I really need to dig into, okay, well, what exactly were they using before? Why, why is Whitney's machine such a breakthrough and so forth? Um, but yeah, so sometimes you're just led back to the question of like, well, how many people were even doing invention at all? Like how many people were even trying to invent stuff? Were we just not trying for the longest time? Um, and it's not literally true that no one was trying to invent anything. Um, obviously, we have records of inventions going way back. Um, uh, agriculture itself, metalworking, pottery, all of these are prehistoric inventions. The plow. Uh, the spinning wheel, the printing press. There, there are plenty of inventions pre, but you know, before the Industrial Revolution. If there weren't, the world of 1700 would be have, have been no different than the world of you know 20,000 BC, and that's not the case. Um, even in in stone tools over the uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of years before uh, behaviorally modern humans, you can see evolution in stone tools. Uh, they went from from simple to you know more advanced. So. Uh, there, there has been invention the whole time, but um, but maybe we just started to get a lot more people involved in invention. Maybe invention was a rare thing. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a Anton House who writes about the history of this stuff um, has has done a lot of investigation in how inventors are influenced by other inventors, and he's um, he's amassed some evidence that it is the very idea essentially that just like you can be an inventor, you can go out there and create new things. Uh, just people getting exposed to that idea, perhaps early in life, is important for them to then go on and and have the you know the tinkering mindset themselves, have the inventing mindset. And so I think there is, I think there is something to that. Um, and I, the way I think about this right now is that there are actually a number of different overlapping flywheels or uh, reinforcing you know feedback loops. Um, some of them are technological, where uh, more technical progress enables us to make more progress, such as when we invent better information technology, it allows us to share ideas, and that allows us to make more progress on all fronts. Or when we uh, in- create fundamental um, manufacturing technology, that enables us to make new kinds of machines, and so that enables progress on many fronts. Um, some of the feedback loops are... Uh, um, are economic. So as we increase uh, wealth, as we amass more wealth, we have more surplus to plow into research and development. And then as as that R&D comes up with new innovations, that allows us to create more wealth. Um, and I think some of them are cultural or philosophical. As um, you, you know, if, if people think that progress is possible and desirable, then they will go out and try to make some of it. And then the more that pe- visible progress is happening, the more that idea gets spread. Um, and so I think there are these feedback loops and reinforcing cycles at multiple levels overlapping with each other. This makes me think of, uh, and I, I guess I should mention really quick, I did, 
I know I, cause I've seen the logo before. So I must have had a tab open at some point for Roots of Progress in the last few years, but I didn't really dig into it until Inyash mentioned it a couple of weeks ago and I've been severely enjoying it. Um, I was thinking about that question about why does it seem, and this is, I, I don't have any background in this. Like I've read a couple of books on like the history of science. I maybe a question to plant a flag in to come back to is, um, why isn't there or is there, but it's not broadcast a, like a whole dis- a discipline on what your what this project is about, the history of, um, progress itself. But what I was going to uh, mention was that, like, I think one thing that comes to mind for why we have, or why it seems to me why we have more inventions in the last couple of centuries than previous ones is like an increase in leisure time and more widespread generational wealth. And the thing that makes me think that, or that came to mind when I had that thought was, I think I've seen every episode of Shark Tank. And uh, more often than not, if someone comes up and they've invented like recyclable shoes or cutlery that you can eat, the answer when someone asks them is like, how much money have you put into the company? They'll say like, oh, 200,000. I got it from my friends and parents or whatever, right? Uh, but that like wasn't a thing people could do 500 years ago. Uh, you know, wealth wasn't yeah, well, as a few people widespread. Could do it, so right. A, a few people could do it. So there were, um, there's the phenomenon of the gentleman scientist who was uh, an aristocrat or somebody who was otherwise perhaps independently wealthy and therefore could choose what to spend uh, his time on and decided to do science. Um uh, in some cases, this is from inherited wealth. In some cases, it's from previous business success. But in, is, it, 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 you basically get people self-funding, right? If you weren't lucky enough to be independently wealthy, um, you could uh, survive on patronage, right? You could, uh, I mean, Galileo and, and Da Vinci and so forth, right? I mean, a lot of these people had um, the wealthy people of their age uh, come and give them money and they would... Uh, uh, perhaps reciprocate through uh, gifts. Um, Galileo is uh, uh, named some of the the moons of Jupiter after some of his Medici. I think he named them the Medician stars, right? Like after mm-hmm. his his uh, his patrons. <laughs> um, so uh, and, and then other people found ways to just uh, maybe you get a job as like a an assistant to one of these folks. Um, Faraday, for example, who made breakthroughs in electromagnetism. Uh, was uh, I, as I'm trying to remember. He was the son of a um, I forget what his parents did, but they were just craftsmen. Um, uh, he was apprenticed to a bookbinder, I believe, and then he ended up going and getting himself a job as an assistant to uh, a, a more eminent scientist who had funding, and uh, and so he, you know, so, so some people were able to do that. But it wasn't just like a you know, scientist wasn't just like a job you could go get. There weren't, uh, there were not yet research universities that the research university is a, is an invention of the 19th century, um, uh, spread it up in Germany and then made its way to other, uh, other places. America didn't have research universities until like the last quarter of the 1800s or so. Um, by the end of the 1800s, researcher was like a job you could go get in a university, but in the, but you know, in the previous century, it was not. So you just had to find your way. You had an interesting post about um, necessity being the mother of invention versus surplus. And it seemed like you came down pretty strongly on mostly it's surplus that people need the extra time uh, and and ability to, to research these things, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think the context of that was uh, something like whether surplus or... Uh, hardship was yes. more conducive to invention, right? And so the you'll get this argument uh, or this hypothesis uh, brought out sometimes that oh, maybe when there's a yeah when there's a hardship or there's a challenge or there's a disaster, maybe that spurs people to be uh, more inventive. Um, often you hear this in the context of war. Oh, isn't war really good for progress because it? Uh, uh, look at all the technologies that were created in and for wartime or that were funded by the military, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, I, I just think, I think these, so what I was saying in that post is like, you know, if you had to choose between uh, uh, times of hardship or, or, or poverty and times of plenty, certainly seems like the times of plenty are more conducive to progress. Um and wartime uh, specifically, because of the importance of having the surplus, yeah, yeah. Wartime specifically seems like a time when governments uh, grab a lot of the surplus and dedicate it specifically to uh, doing things that will help them win the war, including lots of research. So that surplus, instead of being used on you know consumer goods, things that make people happy, gets plowed right into 
all of this. And uh, I think it is more of an argument for surplus than for deprivation at that point. Yeah, I think the thing about war is it um, it certainly changes people's priorities. Yeah. So it redirects them from whatever they were doing to something else. Um, an example for uh, so in World War II, one of the famous things that came out of World War II was radar. Um, and uh, as I and I was I was reading something about um, uh, the history of Bell Labs, and they so the Bell Labs Semiconductor Research Group that created the transistor actually got started in the 1930s. And then, uh, you know, got dis- basically got devoted to war work during the war years and then came back to the transistor after the war. And what do you know, in 1947, they invent the transistor. So hmm. you just have to ask, if it hadn't been for World War II, would we have gotten the transistor like five years earlier? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there are, uh, I've lost count of all the times uh, in reading about this history that I've run across things like, well, so-and-so was at the Institute of such and such, uh, but then they had to close because of the Franco-Prussian War. And so, you know, no research got done for a couple of years, or this researcher had to flee to another country or, um, you know, or got drafted into the military or was killed or, you know, whatever. Um, okay, the most recent thing I was just reading about this was, again, coming back to the optical telegraph. Um, the optical telegraph got invented right around the beginning of the French Revolution. And at one point, they were trying to do an experiment or a demonstration and were attacked by an angry mob who thought that they might be attempting to communicate with like royalists who were locked in a tower somewhere. Mm. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, war is not always uh, it, it, it. I think the thing, you know, the, the main thing you can say about war and progress is it holds people's feet to the fire and it might get people to work harder and invest more and defer consumption. Um, but I think that the things that people always point to, uh, they are, um, I always think back to uh, the essay by Bastiat, uh, the, the famous French economist who wrote an essay called The Seen and the Unseen, or that, that which is seen and that which is not seen, where he, he points out that when people reason about economics, they very often reason about the phenomena that they can see that happen, and they miss all of the things that, the, all the counterfactual, essentially. They miss the things that didn't happen that wouldn't have happened. Like the famous, uh, uh, the famous example of the broken glass where uh, you know, a, a, a child throws a, a rock through a, a plate of glass, breaks the glass, and somebody starts thinking about what an excellent, wonderful event, because this has generated an entire chain of economic activity where someone has to buy new glass, and then the glazier gets to buy a new suit, and then the tailor gets to buy a new, you know, but you miss what would have happened if the glass hadn't been broken. The money that would have spent on new glass would have been spent on something else and would have generated its own separate seam of economic activity. And so it's a similar thing when you talk, you know, so you're kind of missing the obvious fact that value was destroyed in the breaking of the glass. And I think people are kind of missing the obvious fact that a lot of value is destroyed in war and people's lives disrupted and so forth. And set aside the moral, uh, you know, I mean, very few people say that war is actually a good thing, you know, because it causes progress. But if you just look at the economic effects, war is amazingly destructive. And it is amazingly interruptive of people's plans. And I think that includes research plans. Um, and, and it's destructive of research itself. So uh, I think that's what people are missing when they kind of look at those things. I think that's a really valuable lens. I have some vague recollection of Neil deGrasse Tyson make, taking the other side of that argument, where I think it was the United States was partway through developing its own super collider. And the way he described it was that peace broke out and then funding was pulled. Um, <laughs> but I think that yeah, you're, uh, you're, that happens sometimes. Y- yeah. But I, I think your, your counterpoint, it's a good that, reason to, it's a good reason to try to make sure that we have sources of scientific funding that are not entirely dependent on, uh, war or even if it's cold war. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that I, your counterpoint that it's, it's the, the economic costs and the, the upheaval is again, we can't live the counterfactual of like what would have happened if whatever these, inventors or this institution hadn't been disrupted but it's likely i think a case uh, i think a case can be made and you did a good job of starting it was that um things could have come out come about earlier in a lot of cases uh i wanted to hit one more uh, interesting history thing before we pivoted onto the next uh aspect of this the in the why did we wait so long for the threshing machine it seems like you it's a good post you do a lot of research um i I was expecting something technological, and I guess it kind of was technological. It seemed like ultimately it boiled down to the ability to have a centralized factory to mass produce uh, threshers with interchangeable parts and then distribute them widely along rails and also extending credit to to farmers was the major innovation, which is not – it has nothing to do with the thresher itself and the threshing machine. 
it, it was a very interesting flywheel that uh, that needed to get spun up for this to become plausible. Well, I think that's all. I think it's all related. So there is a technical component to it, which is the ability to manufacture machines uh, with high precision that can, uh, you know, that are sort of made to high quality, uh, high precision intolerances. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was needed in order to make a working threshing machine. And the hypothesis I advanced in that essay was uh, the idea that the the threshing machine, unlike some inventions that were adopted in the pre-industrial period, the threshing machine has a certain... uh, it meets a certain bar for on, on, on two different axes simultaneously. One axis is the amount of force that is required in the operation. It's a high force operation to thresh grain, but also the amount of delicacy uh, involved. And so I was pointing out there are, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, you had machines that had um, high, that, that required uh, high degrees of force, but not a lot of subtlety, like uh, a trip hammer that's just pounding iron or uh, a grain mill that's that's grinding grain into powder. Um, you also had machines that required a lot of delicacy, but not a lot of force, such as a loom, uh, which is weaving threads together, right? Mm-hmm. The threshing machine needs both. And when you need both uh, delicacy or you know accuracy uh, and high uh, forces, you need high precision and you need... Um, uh, and you need metal parts, not wooden, and you need those parts to be made and adjusted to uh, to, to very high tolerances. And that was what we didn't have until uh, the, the very late 1700s, really into the into the 1800s, is when that capability was developed through better machine tools. Uh, and so then the the points that you were pointing out. So if you go beyond that and say, okay, well, uh, so suppose I have these machine tools, how do I get the thing made? Uh, you also need a factory. Um, that uh, has has the machine tools, has people who are skilled in operating the machine tools, and maybe people who are have specialized somewhat in manufacturing the particular product that you are creating, whether it be a threshing machine or anything else, as opposed to the way farm equipment was created in the previous period before about 1800 or, or early 1800s, um, is you would have a general craftsman like a blacksmith or a carpenter uh, or maybe a millwright would uh, be the person to create any sort of generic uh, farm machinery. And you, the farmer, would actually perhaps bring the plans to them and say, hey, here's a blueprint. I want you to make it look like this. And then they would have to make one never having made one before and, again, not having um, the, the the latest technology in terms of machine tools. And so then when you ask, okay, but what does it take economically to create the factory and to have it be specialized? Well, you start to realize you need a mass market. You can't do this if you're only serving one farming village. So now you need to create a, a market over a wide geographic area. Well, what does it take to do that? Well, on the, economically, you need capital, but then also you need some infrastructure. You need rail and you need, uh, in order to, to transport your equipment to farmers all over the country and, and get a wide market. You need information technology, at least in terms of newspapers, right? So that you can advertise and, 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 and generate that market. And so you start to see how all of these infrastructure pieces, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the feedback loops. You start to see about how all these infrastructure pieces come together and the whole system is like self-reinforcing. And this is how we get exponential or even and over the long run, super exponential progress. Excellent. So uh, you uh, recently, I think it was recently, I'm not sure how long ago, pivoted from just having a history blog to making this a nonprofit. And if I read the blog posts correctly, this was at least in part due to you having been convinced that we have entered a period of stagnation. Is that correct? Um. Yeah, I would say those things are related. The The main reason I launched the nonprofit is because there was enough support for my work to support more than just myself and to actually start to hire research assistants and, and so on and so forth. And um, oh. uh, and so uh, a nonprofit seemed like the best vehicle for that. Um, but it is also uh, true that over the last year or two, I have uh, gotten convinced that technological progress along the, the frontier of, of technological breakthroughs uh, progress has slowed down in the last 50 years or so relative to the previous uh, 100 years, uh, let's say. Um, certainly, if you compare the 50 years that just ended, say, 19, roughly 1972 to 2020, and you compare that to the same period 100 years earlier, 1870 to 1920, I think uh, there were a lot more breakthroughs in that in that 100-year earlier period than in the most recent one. Um, I'm assuming that you think this is a very bad thing. I think it's a bad thing. I mean, I don't want to get too hysterical about it. I mean, to be clear, progress is still faster now than at almost any point in human history. It's still it's still faster than in the pre-industrial era. So, um, 
but I do think it's something to be concerned about, right? And I think it's something that definitely demands our attention. Uh, we should really be looking into the causes. And in my opinion, we should be looking at how to reverse the slowdown. What convinced you that this was actually a problem? Looking broadly at the history of technology and starting to map out what do I think were the major breakthroughs, when did they occur and in which fields. And uh, just, you know, by the time I had done a certain breadth and depth of research, I was able to start charting these things and come up with a uh, a first handed kind of opinion um, or, or an opinion based on first principles of um, yeah, so when did the big breakthroughs happen in different fields? Uh, and I started to realize that in that period, 1870 to 1920, roughly, uh, there were breakthroughs happening across the board in uh, uh, in applied chemistry, in uh, in manufacturing, in transportation, in agriculture, in health, uh, in energy. And then if you started asking, well, where are the breakthroughs in all those different fields today? You just don't find them. There are holes. You find major breakthroughs in certain fields like information technology, of course. Um, you know, progress in, in computers and the internet has continued racing ahead. That sphere is just as big as, um, you know, any, any of the, the progress that we saw um, in, in that earlier, 100 year earlier period. Um, but what's missing is equivalent progress in fields like manufacturing, um, uh, energy, transportation, construction, uh, and, and so forth. And now, uh, when I first heard that argument, before I came to came to this realization myself, I heard arguments like that, and I wasn't convinced because it wasn't obvious to me that we should expect progress to happen sort of uniformly across all areas at once. Uh, I thought to myself, well, maybe progress is just like a fire hose that gets pointed here and then there, and then um, you know, maybe at any given time, one area is going like gangbusters while other areas are uh, are kind of slow. And that's just the nature of progress. Who's who's to say that it should always happen evenly across across all areas? But then when you look back at that period uh, and you realize, well, there was a time when it was happening across like five different areas at once. Um, then you start to wonder, well, why can't we, you know, why is it that not the case today? I think you had a post about how much growth we should expect and that you, we should expect exponential growth. Did you want to say why you think that's the case? Yeah. And actually, I would go further now. I'd like to write an update to that uh, post uh, at some point because I think over the very long run, we should actually expect super exponential growth. Um, and in fact, that is what we see. Um, we see that we've had periods of of exponential growth, but actually sometimes some fundamental development comes along that kicks us into a higher uh, energy band, uh, metaphorically speaking, and the exponent actually goes up, um, and we uh, and and we're we're at a, we're still you know we're on a, like a new even faster exponential curve. If you plot it if you plot it on a semi log curve, it's not just a, a, a straight line. It's like a line that goes in segments, um, and every once in a while the slope of the line gets increased. The transistor might be like a so good think, example of that, right? Um, no, these are more really big scale things like the industrial revolution itself or oh, okay. um, the agricultural revolution. Yeah. Um, I didn't mean to, to derail uh, your thought there. I just, I feel like no, you, that's you, all right. you hit my, because uh, I had a, yeah. a flag of skepticism when it was like, oh no, 1870 to 1920 had more advances than 1970 to 2020. And then I'm thinking, well, hold on. We had like, the internet and smartphones, but you you did call that out as a, like kind of an explicit exception to the other um, categories. Uh, yeah, and again, it's uh, the, the term stagnation hypothesis or or technological stagnation is a little unfortunate because it makes people think that you're talking about like zero progress, and uh, it's just obviously not the case. And so, um, like a more accurate name for it would be like. Uh, uh, whatever reduced progress in certain areas, <laughs> less reduced <catchy>. overall progress <laughs> at the technological frontier. But yeah, it's less catchy, so we just call it stagnation for short. Um, now I've uh, I feel like you asked me a question that I haven't answered yet, and I've lost uh, what it was. I was about to say something. Oh, uh, why we were expecting geometric progress as the baseline? Ah, uh, yes. So, um, yeah. So why should we expect? Uh, ex why is why? Why should we even think that exponential progress is, is is possible? And so I made a couple of points in that in that post. Um, one of them was just like empirically or historically speaking, we've seen sustained exponential progress in in a number of areas over long periods of time. Uh, theoretically speaking, um, the model that you can use for this is very simple. Uh, things grow exponentially when they grow in proportion to their size. And um, another way to look at that is. 
Uh, imagine that every unit of investment uh, that we could put into progress generated a constant um, like percentage uh, you know, growth. And imagine that we can always put a constant percentage of our society's resources into progress, right? So then, um, uh, then you actually have a, a like that's a self-sustaining model where um, uh, it. Uh, so I should back up a little bit. This part of this was in um, in reference to a paper that has been much discussed in the progress community, which is titled "Are Ideas Getting Harder to Find." And this paper was pointing out that in a number of areas, uh, we can see that um, it takes exponentially increasing levels of research investment and resources in order to generate um, a constant percentage of growth. Uh, or another way to to, to uh, look at that is it takes exponentially increasing resources to sustain exponential growth with a constant exponent. Um, and so part of what I was pointing out in this essay is that's not unsustainable. Like as long as you are growing exponentially and can devote a constant portion of your resources to continuing to grow, then you actually can continue to pour an exponentially increasing uh, number of resources into uh, R&D and ultimately into growth. Now, the thing that has been pointed out to me since then, uh, and that I said a little bit about in the essay, but I didn't harp on, is that um, uh, I'm equiv like the term resources is a little bit vague there. Um, and uh, it, it, economic growth is growth in, you know, dollars or wealth. It may be that you need more than to, to, to plow exponentially increasing wealth into R&D. It may also need be that you need to plow exponentially increasing numbers of people into R&D and that you need an exponential growth in the number of researchers, which is what we have had. Uh, if that is the case, then you, in order to sustain progress, you also need an exponentially growing population. And the salient fact is that in the last 50 years or so, uh, the growth in population has been slowing. So the rate of population growth is going down. We are now on a sub-exponential population growth curve. And while many people in the mainstream see this as a good thing because they're worried about overpopulation pressures, um, there's a, a minority uh, in and around the progress community who are worried about the long-term effects of a, uh, a, a slowing population growth and possibly even long-term a shrinking population in that we might not have enough people to continue pushing progress forward at an exponential rate. Hmm. Would you also possibly need exponentially smarter people like before just someone who's kind of a genius could contribute but now you have to be a super genius and in the future we need like three ultra super genius level that was something i was going to ask about because you know the you, know, you mentioned faraday which made me think of like maxwell and you, you know finding the the unifying physics behind electromagnetism is something that can only really be found once and how many other kinds of things like that are there that we can find uh I suspect they're harder to find than, say, electromagnetism. But that's that's less of a statement and more of a question. Yeah. So fundamentally, I think the question of our ideas getting harder to find, I think the answer is clearly yes. And uh, and it makes sense from a certain perspective that like, uh, look, you, you pick the low-hanging fruit first. In fact, if you don't pick the low-hanging fruit first – you're kind of an idiot, right? Like you're not being very smart and strategic about how you're going about attacking problems if you're not attacking the highest ROI problems first. So we would almost certainly expect, you know, sort of... Now, um, that said, it's not as if things... So, okay, one thing that happens is sometimes you have some kind of a conceptual breakthrough that opens up an entirely new field. And when a new field is opened up, there's a whole lot more low-hanging fruit. So it's kind of like the the fruit orchards are fenced off and every once in a while we like break through a fence or we find the door, you know, the gate in the fence and we go through it and now we're in a new orchard and there's lots of low-hanging fruit to be picked off, right? Um, but uh, but that just takes the whole problem a step backwards, which is how do we keep finding new fields and new orchards at an exponential rate, right? Because you have to keep, you have to increase the rate at which you're finding the new orchards. Um so uh, I do think that, yes, um, progress in both science and technology gets harder to make um, as we go on because of the low-hanging fruit thing. But we also have exponentially increasing uh, resource, you know, more people, 
more wealth to plow into this and better technology, right? So we have the internet today as a way to share ideas and to look up information. That ought to make you know researchers more productive. We have uh, better tools and scientific instruments today. Um, we have better ways of collecting and processing information. We have you know we have spreadsheets and we have Python and we have um, uh, you know all you know uh, all, all sorts of things like that. So. Um, the low hanging fruit keeps getting harder to pick or or you know is going away and the remaining fruit is higher but at the same time we keep getting you know better at picking it um and and having more resources with which to do so so i think those things are just intention and it's not obvious which one of them should win out or whether we can you know balance them over the long term so with the focus moving a bit at least to intention here does that bring us to progress studies as both moral imperative and civic duty um, sure. I mean, you know, this comes back to, we were talking earlier about the idea of progress and are people, you know, to what extent are people motivated to invent uh, and discover because they see progress as possible and desirable? Um, and it might've been in a, in a previous age before the scientific revolution, uh, maybe people did not see progress as even possible. Maybe they just thought that, you know, everything there was to know had already, was already known, um, or uh, you know they they didn't see that there was this potential enormous amount of growth ahead of us. Today, I think people know that progress is possible. It's not clear that they think that a technological and industrial progress is desirable. And uh, and so that's the other piece of the puzzle. If people broadly uh, look at material progress and technological and scientific progress with fear and skepticism and distrust, is that going to drive resources away from? Uh, from the project of progress, and is that going to slow things down? And uh, you know, one of my hypotheses is that that is what has happened uh, to a significant degree in the last several decades. Yeah, I, I've known people who are very against progress. Um, is that? I don't know. How do we? How do we fight that though? Is it more of a getting them <coughs> when they're children and making them think about how great progress is through awesome cartoons? Or it, it's it feels kind of you know weird to say go after them when they're young to teach kids how great progress is but also it's true and i think it's important so i it is sort of true and i do think that um i do think that this should start in school um i think you need to be careful about uh uh proselytizing to children which i don't you know it um, I don't think you should just sort of go out there and try to ram an ideology down their throats but i do think that there are whole aspects of history that are neglected in traditional curricula. Um, the history of technology is not really taught as such, and um, the history of how industrial civilization was created. And so I think just at least the facts should get out there. Like people should, and this so this came back to sort of progress studies as a civic duty. I think given how important industrial uh, civilization and, and, and industrial topics are to, to life, to the world, how much political conversations and, and ideological conversations revolve around them, I think a responsible citizen in, in the modern world has a kind of responsibility to like learn about, look, where does your way of life come from? What generates it? How was it invented? Do you realize that not everybody throughout, you know, throughout all of history enjoyed the gifts that you take for granted? Um, and, and why did we create the world that we created? Why do we have large, uh, you know, farms with, uh, that are monocropped and that use, uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides and that where we're harvesting them with, you know, large, uh, agricultural equipment like combine harvesters, right? Like, what is the reason for that? Is that an arbitrary decision that we made and it could go any way? Is that a corruption of uh, greedy, evil uh, industrial capitalists? Or is it actually based on um, like constraints of physics and biology and uh, an engineering solution to satisfy human needs and desires and preferences in the face of, uh, of, of reality's constraints? Right? Yeah, I like- And so I think- some of the basics of that need to be taught. Yeah, I liked your phrasing. I think you said once that every single piece of technology is a solution to a problem that humanity had. And if you want to phase out or roll back a technology, you need to find some other way to some other solution to that problem uh, or else that problem's going to come back and it could be potentially lethal to many people. 
Yeah, so this is sort of the Chesterton's fence of progress studies, right? You call it Chesterton's combine harvester. Hmm. Uh, it is the you know if you don't understand why a, we need a piece of technology uh, or industry, if you don't understand why some infrastructure or some invention or some practice is there in the first place, then you have no business calling for its removal or abolishment or banning. Um, j- you know, just as. Chesterton said, if you, if you don't see the reason for the fence, you have no reason for calling for the fence to be taken down. Um, go learn it first, and then you can argue that maybe this isn't the optimal way to do things. But you're going to be arguing from a position of knowledge and not from one of in- ignorance. Yeah, I found the plastics example particularly striking since you pointed out that just about all plastics are there to replace animal products like tortoise shells or whale bones that were used before. And Exactly. Uh, Yeah, those species were hunted almost to extinction, some of them to extinction. And if you were to get rid of plastics, like so many people seem to be saying we should do right now, well, then you now have a bunch of things which the entire world either has to go without or, well, I mean, or hunt the species extinction, but that lasts all of two months or something. So Right. (laughs) And to be clear, you know, the fact that we used to do X and now we did Y, which is better, doesn't mean we can't find Z, which is even better than any of that, right? Like, I'm not saying that just because something was better that we should, the last thing in the world that I would say is that we should take any technology that we currently use and stick with it forever. Um, Certainly not. I hope to obsolete everything, you know, (laughs) everything that we have today, I hope to be obsolete uh, eventually one day with an even better thing that comes along. So um, I'm certainly not making any sort of argument, uh, uh, you know, along those lines. But again, um, uh, like you should not, out of a position of ignorance, accidentally advocate for what amounts to regress, going back to, uh, you know, older solutions. And it is amazing to me just, I mean, people are really taken in by this. Okay, example, um, I read an article recently uh, talking about, um, oh, maybe we don't need to use air conditioning. And the way this article was framed was like, hey, don't you know, uh, there are... um, there are these places in like Persia and other parts of the world where, you know, for thousands of years, people have been finding ways to beat the heat. And uh, we can, you know, take their techniques and adapt them. Look, you can do this thing where you create this uh, 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 tunnel or alleyway and like the wind blows through it and it cools you off. And it's like, I'm just amazed at the the notion that there was some that this was like an already solved problem a thousand years ago and that we totally didn't need air conditioning at all because there's a completely natural solution and people fall for this all all the time. And, uh, I just, I just want people to like, if you hear, if you ever hear this, if you ever hear, Oh, this thing that we use modern technology for actually, and the, and the technology is ubiquitous for, it was actually totally solved by quote unquote natural techniques or by traditional you know techniques a thousand years ago. You should just be very skeptical about that because it's it's almost never true. There's a reason why we had the invention. There's a reason why the invention took over, and it's usually not a totally arbitrary reason. Yeah, if cooling our house through, um, well, actually, I don't know how you naturally cooled stuff, but I do know how you naturally heated a house. But uh, you know, if, if that was easier, then we'd just be doing that, right? Um, we, we wouldn't be using, uh, exactly. baseboard heating or whatever we do now. Um, this, this kind of, uh, is a not bad time to, to swing back to that question I had earlier about, um, like you mentioned, kind of just teaching the virtue of why progress is a good thing, you know, somewhere towing the line between like indoctrination and education. But, you know, why, why was it I was able to go through a college education and never see a chapter on the history of progress in any book I was ever told to read? Do you have any any guess as to why this wasn't like a a field of study that was widely discussed before? I don't have a good answer there. I mean, history tends to focus on the history of politics, and there's a very good reason to focus on the history of politics. That's an extremely important thing to learn. Um, the history of technology, um, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's, I mean, it's something much more recent that, uh, you know, just in, if you just, if you think of the overall, you know, history of of education itself and the teaching of uh of of various curricula like like the the very notion that hey some kind of industrial revolution is happening um and we should be teaching people the history of it like that's a more recent notion um but i don't really know no i I don't have the answer to that no i guess that makes sense a bit i mean to me it's just as far as i know and i don't know a lot but you're you're the first person to say hey look let's look at like technological advancement as its own dedicated thing and what what happened here in the last 5000 years to get us to where we are today and what sort of trends were there and that sort of thing um 
By the way, I, I do know who to ask about this problem <laughs> or this question. Uh, the person to ask about this is Matt Bateman. Uh, Matt is the VP of pedagogy at a private school uh, uh, network called Higher Ground Education. Um, I worked, so Higher Ground actually commissioned me uh, last summer to create a high school level progress course uh, oh. a, 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 in the history of technology, which I have done. And that curriculum is currently being taught through their private high school, um, the, which is called the Academy of Thought and Industry. Uh, and Matt worked uh, with me on creating that course. And um, he has a lot of thoughts about the where the history of progress uh, ties into the uh, the history of, uh, or, or sorry, ties into an overall uh, education. He also has a lot of thoughts on um, how values and ideological topics should be covered in a curriculum, uh, such that they're not entirely skirted, but also such that you are teaching kids to think for themselves and not indoctrinating them. Um, and on top of all of this, he is currently teaching a class, uh, a course in the history of education. So if you wanted to go back and look at what to have people how have people thought about curricula and the and the the meaning and you know of, of education and uh, over over history going back twenty five hundred years? Um, he's the person to answer that as well. So maybe a future podcast guest for you. That's awesome. Absolutely. That sounds like a really cool endeavor, and I need to check out this school. Um. <laughs> Does, uh, yeah, check out the Academy of Thought and Industry, and uh, you can find my course on the history of progress being taught through through them. And it's taught through their virtual program, so uh, it's open to homeschoolers or um, you know, anybody who just wants to supplement, uh, you know, whatever high school they're going through now with a uh, um, with like a side class. Uh, it, it's it's available. Fantastic. We'll definitely link to that. Hell yeah. Uh, I was wondering is is um, pushing for greater. Um, greater recognition of this and greater teaching of it like one of the one of the things that roots of progress is focusing on or is that more of like leaving it to higher edu or higher ground and those sorts of places it's one of the things i would like us to focus on yeah so right now uh my organization the the nonprofit is uh, the the core thing that we're sponsoring is my research and the book that I'm writing. So I'm putting all this stuff together into a book. Uh, working title is The Story of Industrial Civilization. And the subtitle is Towards a New Philosophy of Progress for the 21st Century. So uh, that is kind of the core project. But we're also starting to um, organize some events, uh, some public and some private, where we're getting together people of various uh, in various fields to talk about, you know, what does progress mean in your area? And I would definitely at some point like to get together educators to talk about, uh, you know, what is what does progress mean for education? Should it be taught more? Um, uh, what does it take to do that? And so, um, you know, to, to what extent uh, my nonprofit will be directly involved in that versus uh, maybe indirectly involved by, you know, um, hosting uh, people to come together for a discussion about it uh, remains to be determined, but it's something, it's definitely something we'd like to be involved in in some way. Awesome. Uh, Stephen, I realize I monopolized a lot of this, trying to get this down this garden path. <laughs> did, you, did you have, uh, I think you said, had like a question or two or something to throw in or any other comments? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate and encourage you to drive since you had a, you know, an actual trajectory in mind were kind of just free form thoughts. I mean, I, you know, Whenever I get the opportunity to to talk to somebody who does anything remotely like what you're doing, I'm always curious if there's something that throughout your research you found just to be like the most surprising, you know, or the the most uh, I guess unsuspected, which is the same as surprising. But hmm. was, was were you ever researching something and just had your mind blown by like no way, can't believe I found this? <laughs> um, yeah, wow. What are some things? Uh, I, I'm just going to start uh, throwing a few ideas out there. Um, uh, the so, more the I merrier. Mean, the whole the notion of stagnation itself, like I said, I actually started out quite skeptical of this idea, um, uh, and so I was surprised to find myself coming around and, and agreeing with it. Um, I have been somewhat surprised to find uh, the number of, as I as I mentioned earlier, kind of the the hidden technological requirements behind a number of inventions. Uh, one of my first really popular essays was on the history of the bicycle and why wasn't the bicycle invented until the late 1800s. And, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned this a bit in the post, but since I've written it, I actually see even more how this is the case that um, really materials and manufacturing uh, techniques that existed before the 1800s would not have supported anything like a real bicycle industry. Um, uh, we really needed the the machine tools and the advanced uh, m working with metal and rubber and so on and so forth to get anything like a practical bicycle. Um, and again, I mentioned this with the threshing machine as well. So this 
uh, you know, these hidden technologies like the ability to create precision parts um, are, you know, I mean, every cons- everybody knows about like the light bulb and knows that, hey, the, you know, we didn't always have light bulbs and they were invented at this point and then we had them. Uh, but it turns out producer goods can be just as important to the overall history of progress as consumer goods. And so learning about some of those things. Um, I think also learning about uh, both how much progress was able to be made in many areas without a firm theoretic basis um, and also how much theory held us back and how much it was it was necessary. Um, I don't know. The history of, of medicine and public health is kind of a, a an interesting example here. There was like a significant amount of progress made in the 1700s, maybe even as early as the 1600s in just sort of like cleaning up the environment, um, in uh, reducing the level of insects who are buzzing about, in um, draining swamps and standing water, in try- just trying to be more hygienic um, with things like uh, uh, human and animal waste, um, even things like, hey, maybe we should bury the corpses outside the city, um, you know, rather than right in the middle of the city. Uh, there were like a number of, of advances like that that were made purely based on like empirical correlations with no germ theory whatsoever. Um, but at the same time, uh, oh, and by the way, the first vaccine for smallpox was uh, came long before the germ theory. But then at the same time, there were zero vaccines for any other diseases until after the germ theory. Um, and it was actually the key, uh, Louis Pasteur, who was one of the two really key drivers of the germ theory, was the one who started creating vaccines for new diseases. So um, uh, so it's just fascinating to kind of see like, oh, yeah, you can actually make a lot of progress with sort of like tinkering on the basis of no real theory. And then you really plateau and you you really need the theory to kind of like move beyond a certain um, uh, stu- you know stuck point. That was awesome. I was just grinning enthusiastically the entire time. I think the the germ theory example was the was part way formed in my mind. But um, yeah, I mean, it, you can get a long way when you realize that washing your hands between surgeries results in fewer dead patients. But then having the understanding of like, oh right, okay, germs. This explains a lot, and then and then you've got all that time to explore <laughs> what all that explains. Um, yeah, and one of the things that the theory gives you, by the way. Um, is uh, just better tools of diagnosis and measurement. So for instance, um, some of the progress that was made before the germ theory was in cleaning up uh, municipal water supplies. Um, But the people who drove that were kind of driving it. Yes, they had a general idea that cleaner water was better for health. It was also partly just aesthetic, like we want the water to look and smell and taste better. Um, And they only had sight and smell and taste to go by. And so... uh, after the germ theory, we now have uh, we now know exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for microorganisms, and in fact, we're looking for specific microorganisms. And now we have like a new metric. Um, we can look at the municipal water, and we can put it under a microscope, and we can count the number of bacteria that we see, and then we can try to reduce that target. And now, once you have a new way of measuring, and you know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, now you can improve your filtering and you can also do things like adding chlorination to the water uh, with uh, sodium hypochlorite, which is going to kill uh, the, the the germs, which you would never have come to that if you were just thinking of, uh, you know, kind of like sight, smell and taste. Let's make it. Yeah, so let's that's make it how look good. A, a theoretical yeah. basis, you know, comes along and, and helps you uh, get to the next level. That's awesome. Um, this one might be the answer might just be wait to buy the book. But um, <laughs> so we talked about what, what the roots of progress is, but I was kind of curious if there was like a succinct tagline for what are the roots of progress? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the book is not going to be titled the roots of progress. And in part, because I'm not going to fully tackle that question. I think that is, um, the the book is going to be focused on what, what literally it's going to be more ground level. It's going to be literally what progress happened. Like what, what, what did progress consist of at a very, in a very concrete, just object level? What were the discoveries and the breakthroughs that made the modern world? And then it will go into a little bit of philosophical analysis of sort of like, well, Hey, is this a good thing? Did, did material progress actually translate into well being for humanity? Uh, can progress continue? What should we do about it as a society? Um, actually getting to the roots and saying like, this is the cause, you know, that occupies like an entire discipline of uh, a, a, an entire field of economic history and people have devoted careers and shelves full of books to this. So, I mean, I have some hypotheses certainly. And I think, um, 
you know, I would just point back to the part of the conversation where we were talking about the feedback loops, right? Um, uh, part of it, you know, so one one source of uh, one source of progress is surplus wealth. One source is the growth of science. One source, I think, is the philosophy of progress itself, the idea that progress is possible and desirable. And I think it's, uh, you know, there are a number of feedback loops like this, and ultimately, I think it's all of those things um, coming together. Um, I didn't mention this, but I do think that uh, political institutions um, are, are 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 also part of it. Financial institutions and so forth, um, <clears throat> needing, you know, but having the right um, ha- corporate law and IP law and, and, you know, those sorts of things, um, the opening up of, of, uh, of, uh, free trade and, uh, et cetera. I think all those things helped. Um, but exactly how much, uh, you know, exactly which of these things were necessary, which were sufficient, um, uh, which of them to really put the emphasis on that is an even bigger and longer project. Uh, maybe one that I'll tackle in the future. Oh man. Oh. I was just recently reading the, someone has to get hurt occasionally post and I was, really wanting to get into that but there's no way we have the time like how to get into the (laughs) how regulatory things interact with everything so maybe some other day sure well maybe this is too big of a well we'll we'll find out my my last thing i wanted to ask about because i knew that you were a a transhumanist and that you're at least you don't see why progress should stop at like let's make everything okay like why not make it better right um you know not just let's cure cancer but let's cure aging that sort of thing and i i'm also a huge fan of that um, so I guess if, uh, I had to put it in a succinct question, um, I guess I was curious about any like predictions or forecasts that you might have that are informed by your historical understanding of technological progress, uh, or maybe are you in this minute, actually just tying to the answer, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of progress? Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if I would use the label transhumanist uh, for myself, but I do definitely agree with the idea that like, uh, I, d- I definitely agree with uh, the importance and the value of longevity research. I would love to be immortal, um, which I mean, I don't interpret that as, uh, you know, literally that it's be impossible to kill somebody, which I think is probably impossible, but I would love for, uh, for nobody to have a finite, uh, you know, sort of fixed lifespan in advance where it's like, look, you can only live a hundred plus years at max. And, that's just it. Like, I think we should have indefinite lifespans if we can. Um, and I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be possible. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, why not have, why not let people have as many, um, years of health and strength and vitality as they choose? Um, uh, that shouldn't be artificially limited by anything. So looking forward to that world, um, hoping I will live to see it. Strong but, agree. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't make a lot of predictions about the future. Um, uh, I think the future is very hard to predict. And I think predicting it is a pretty specialized discipline. Um, I'm hoping to help people see some of the big picture trends. And I'm particularly hoping to help people see that progress was not a fluke. It was not a, a one-time thing where we got lucky for a couple hundred years and now it's over. Uh, but that progress is a thing that we can continue to make happen. And that there's a lot more progress left to be made. We're nowhere close to done. Uh, maybe we will be someday, but uh, not in the next hundred years and probably not in the next thousand years. Right. Um, so like, let's keep going. <laughs> no, no, no reason to rest on our laurels. Um, we should absolutely have longevity research. We should have nanotechnology. We should have fusion energy. We should be settling the solar system and eventually the galaxy um, and so forth. And so I really, you know, one of the things I want, one of the ideas that I want to leave people with is that um, if you look at the broad uh, sweep of progress, you re- start to realize that we are fantastically wealthy compared to our ancestors one or 200 years ago. And if you just project that into the future, it means that 100 or 200 years from now, maybe even less, people can be fantastically wealthy compared to the present. Um, things that were once luxuries for the rich such as uh, electric lights uh, or electricity itself or uh, central heating or indoor plumbing and a refrigerator and a toilet, uh, all of those things are now considered basic necessities of decent living. And so we should do it again. We should have a future world where the things that we today consider to be luxuries for the rich or things that aren't even invented yet and don't even exist in the future are considered basic necessities of decent living for you know the broad, broad mass of humanity. And um, so let's continue that upward trend and let's, let's have a technologically ambitious view of the future, right? Um, not just a view where we uh, sort of avert disaster and cure disease, uh, but a, a view where we actually create a future that today seems like science fiction or even fantasy. We can do it. 
Hell yeah. Well, I, I would, I can't think of a better note to end on, even though I'd like to pick your brain for longer, but that that's, uh, yeah. I mean, that sounds like an excellent cap. I mean, Enosh, do you have anything else? No, I don't. Uh, thank you for staying over with us so we could go go a little bit further on this. It was it was really wonderful. How uh, can people find your stuff and support you and all the things that uh, help make the Roots of Progress a powerful, strong organization? Yeah, thanks for asking. You can find us at rootsofprogress.org. Uh, that's where you can find my writing and subscribe by email. Uh, I'm also pretty active on Twitter. You can follow me. My handle there is Jason Crawford. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to financially support our work, uh, we do have a Patreon and we do take donations through PayPal and um, other means. So uh, you can find out all about all that uh, at rootsofprogress.org as well. Awesome. So yeah, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you also for the the lead on Matt Bateman. Maybe we will try contacting him as well. And this has been great. I hope people really do, at the very least, go check out the blog. Go check out some of these posts. They are really enjoyable and interesting. And I am betting you will get sucked in deep like I did. Yeah, we're going to link to several of them in the show notes. Thanks so much. Very flattering to hear. And it was great to be here. And this is a, this is a fun conversation. Thank you. Thanks again, Jason. This was great. Stephen, that went so well, we almost forgot to thank a patron. That was an awesome conversation with Jason Crawford. And we also have to uh, thank somebody else this week or this episode, uh, Richard Kemp. Thank you so much for making it possible uh, to help us have this awesome conversation that we got to enjoy. Um, I hope you had fun with it too. Uh, we told him after we got done recording that, or I did, that I think he's just one of the most like eloquent speakers we've had on. You know, we could just prompt him and he'd go for 10 minutes and it was great. So I did sit there for 15 minutes and I realized that I hadn't spoken. So I was like, okay, I should actually chime in because I was just having fun listening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, Richard Kemp, you are this this Fortnite's hero. Thank you so much. And, Thank you. Uh, this podcast is possible because of you and uh, the roots of progress will grow strong and deep because of your contribution to this whole endeavor. So thank you for that. That's right. If you found uh, Jason's stuff worthwhile and the project that he's, he's working on, uh, you know, net benefit to humanity. Just think you helped make, uh, you helped widen his audience. So if anyone else would like to do the same for who knows what else comes next, um, you can find us, uh, you can find a link to our Patreon on our website, the Bayesian That's right. Uh, you can also rate and review us at your local place that you get podcasts from, which I guess is on your phone. So very local <laughs> to you. <laughs> Um, we appreciate that because it helps get the word out to more people and that is always very valuable as well so thank you everybody for all that you do agreed I can't put it any more eloquently than that thanks Inyash alright uh, we'll see y'all in two weeks you betcha you betcha